Great. So this is the last media research session for this year's Beyond Conference. Uh, we have four presenters uh, presenting with us today, and we'll go through the presentations as per usual, and then in the end we'll conclude with a Q&A session. So during the presentations, uh, please don't feel shy and drop your questions in the chat. So without further ado, uh, I'll um, leave the stage, the virtual stage, for Simona Manning to present on Stepping Through Interactive. Okay, so hi, I'm Simona Manni. I'm a PhD student at DC Labs, University of York. Uh, really happy to be here at Beyond 2020, and I'll be talking about Stepping Through Interactive, which is a nonlinear participatory film on mental health that emerged from my PhD. Uh, I'm now at the end in my fourth year, so um, COVID allowing, the work is almost done. Uh, the images that you would see through these presentations are part of the film, and the half-painted face here is a symbol uh, that participants have created. So we were not trying to remake Braveheart, as, uh, as it was suggested by some. And uh, yeah, so I will just briefly describe the film first, and then I will talk through the process of making it. Um, Stepping Through is an interactive film about mental health. It was created by four men that have direct experience of mental health problems. And in the film, they discuss which elements were helpful in the process of recovery. Um, it's a video poetry film where um, the themes are explored, uh, explored through emotional, metaphorical clips. And there are both personal uh, themes that are relevant to only one participant uh, and um, communal themes that are common to the entire group. Uh, the viewers in the film are encouraged to explore the poetic materials by selecting feelings that were most resonant to them. Um, the idea here is to encourage empathy and self-reflection in viewers with a view that mental health affects, of course, everyone, and elements that were important for the recovery of these participants are actually elements that are at play in anyone's lives. And this film was assembled in Cutting Room, which is an object-based media authoring tool produced by DC Labs. Yesterday, I met the researchers. There were uh, three of my colleagues, Andrew Walter, John Gray, and Alvaro Cesares, who presented specifically on cutting rooms, so how the software was born, how it's and what it can be used for. Uh, and I think this was recorded, so if you're interested, um, please go back and look at that presentation. My project is only one example of how cutting room can be used, uh, but it's a very flexible tool, so it would be um, interesting to see what other projects are made. Um, in this case, the film was produced in collaboration with Converge, which is an organization that offers um, arts courses for free to mental health service users, and it's based at York St. John University. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, in case you're not familiar with participatory filmmaking, is um, an inclusive and democratic form of media production. Uh, where people who are not professional filmmakers are supported in producing their own uh, media work and exploring issues that are close to them. Um, one ambition of participatory filmmaking is to open space for underrepresented groups to articulate their experiences, um, often counteracting some of the um, stereotypes that could be present in mainstream media. And as such, it can be particularly effective at um, addressing complex issues, including mental health. Uh, so there is a wide literature around the stereotypes, stigma and misunderstandings that are often present in mainstream media around mental health problems and people who are experiencing them. Um, and again, literature that describes how this can affect audiences and create barriers towards accessing support or even just self-acceptance for people that are struggling with their mental health. So participatory filmmaking uh, is something that could uh, counteract these views. And um, before my PhD and alongside, I'm a participatory filmmaker and I've worked with different communities 
And what I've noticed is that often in this kind of production, there is a tension between um, producing a linear film um, and at the same time accommodating many voices. Uh, this is a kind of production in which there isn't a single author and um, or a hierarchy of producers, but rather uh, every member of the community should have an equal say and their voice should have an equal space within the film. And often um, the requirements of linear filmmaking means that we need to streamline those voices and sometimes we tend to represent the majority in a sense of the community, the view that is shared by the majority, which somehow um, can lead to oversimplification and some of the pitfalls of mainstream media, the mainstream media sometimes is accused of. Um, so my research looked at could we use interactive media and nonlinear production to uh, create polyphonic films where there is enough space for every community member to express their views? And we looked uh, at this question uh, through, throughout my PhD and we structured the research in three phases. Uh, the first phase was working with an existing linear film, uh, which again is Stepping Through. So Stepping Through was a, a traditional film made by uh, four men that had direct experience of mental health problems back in 2016. Um, and in this film, they were discussing isolation and community in recovery. So my first study was going back to those participants that I worked with before my PhD, and they construct the film with them to have a look at possible uh, areas that were unexpressed or only hinted at due, due to the linear uh, shape of the film. And, and we did that using self-reflection, creative methods. Uh, we drew some um, key images from the film to see if there was more to be told behind the, those images. And we found that where, there were indeed a number of expressive needs that were unfulfilled by that particular version of the film. Um, so then the second study, which was really long um, and complex, was around using those unexpressed views to inform a nonlinear shape for the film. Uh, the participants didn't have any experience in designing interactive media, and I didn't either, so it was a, really a journey of discovery together. We used uh, paper-based methods to arrange different narrative materials uh, in relation to each other. Uh, so there was the existing film there, uh, but also new um, materials that we designed. Then we turned this map into a digital map of the entire content and how things are linked to each other. And then the participants curated a way for viewers to journey through these materials um, in order to, again, encourage empathy and understanding and uh, we filmed all the additional clips uh, in a traditional filmmaking kind of approach. And then all the materials were moved into cutting room, where thanks to the help of my colleagues, they were assembled in a working interactive film prototype that now we have. And at this stage, we are evaluating this new version of Stepping Through, the nonlinear version, both with the original creators and with a number of external audiences with a varying degree of mental health awareness, just to check if the film meets its ambitions. And I'm just going to quickly talk through some of the key features of Stepping Through. So the original linear film is still present, it's interspersed within this complex structure. Viewers are presented with some poetic emotional clips and then uh, with menus to select which feelings are resonant to them and then they are presented with more material according to their own emotional tendency. Um, at the end the, they are presented with a self-generated clip that um, um, it's an overview of the emotions they have been through during the film and also with a um, documentary style clip of the participant they seem to have the most in common with. So there is a coexistence of the original video poetry approach with a more documentarist um, style content so that viewers can engage both on an emotional level and a more cognitive level with the experiences of participants. At the same time, uh, if viewers decide not to engage with the interac interactive menus, they can just sit back 
and the film will still carry on. So there is still a possibility of a linear tradition of viewing within the film. And this my last slide is around just showing how expanding the narrative shape of the film from linear to complex has also expanded the representation of the issue examined in the film. So while in the linear film there was quite a binary dichotomy between isolation equals ill health and community equals well-being, which is not wrong, but it's perhaps a bit oversimplified. Now uh, the issue is still there, um, but we have um, much more complex and rich tapestry of viewpoints. So for some participants, isolation is loneliness, but for others it can be used as self-reflection. Um, for some participants, it was really important to do inner work more than connecting to the outside world, while for others, those connections in communities were extremely important. So hopefully the viewer will be presented with content that is relevant to them due to this empathy-based, feeling-based navigation. Um, in my poster, which is on the Beyond website, um, I've put a link to find out more about this project, but unfortunately, I'm really sorry, apparently the link didn't work uh, and there wasn't any way of fixing it. So I've created a new link. Uh, if you want to find out more, please use tinyurl.com slash stepping through one. Um, here you can find a couple of papers that are published uh, on the research a link to the original film, just in case you're curious to see what it looked like to begin with. And also, um, if you want, you can leave your content, your contact to be involved in the evaluation of the film. So we are going to present the film to audiences around the end of January. Um, if you're curious to watch it, it would be a matter of watching it online. And then if you want, answering a short questionnaire. So it would be great if anyone wants to get involved, you can leave your contact in there or uh, just feel free to email me at my email address. Thank you. Thank you, Simona, fantastic. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, next up is Aimone Bodini from Brunel University, where he's a doctoral researcher, and he's going to talk to us about virtual locations. All right. Hello, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Aimone and I work as doctoral researcher at Brunel University uh, as part of the Story Future program. And uh, today I will talk about uh, virtual production and uh, more specifically about virtual location scouting. First of all, we have to look back at uh, the past and uh, we can clearly see how uh, the movie industry, uh, movie industry and technology as this uh, very deep, very rooted bond since the beginning with the interaction of sound, of color, and today uh, with the adoption of real-time game engines uh, and virtual production. Uh, this uh, has very important implications for both the audience, because that means new languages, new ways of being engaged during the, the vision, during the viewing, but also in particular for film professionals, because this changes the way they they, they used to they are used to work. Uh, virtual production, what it is? Uh, there are a lot of different uh, ways to describe uh, virtual production. Uh, Weta, which is one of the main post-production companies in the world, describe virtual production in a very let's say simple way, uh, describing as the is where the physical and digital worlds meet uh, a more let's say uh, um, a, a more sophisticated uh, um, description of virtual production uh, that i try to give is a process enabled by real-time graphic engines made filmmaker friendly through the use of immersive technologies and aim to foster creativity, collaboration, and decision making quickly and effectively. But uh, we both know, we all know that uh, sometimes images are worth more than a thousand of words. So let's take a look at this quick video. Sorry for the audio. When we thought, how are we going to approach lighting? We knew we needed to do something new, completely new. And we had the idea to do this in virtual reality take the tools of virtual reality and apply those to filmmaking in a way that's never been done before. We built a video game, the purpose of which is to make a movie. Inside that video game, instead of cars and guns, 
and points being scored. We've got cameras and lights and lions. So we go inside the volume, which is this technology blank space. The space that's filled with grids that hold virtual reality sensors, things that tell the computers where virtual cameras are in space or virtual steady cams or virtual dollies or virtual cranes. These all look like and feel like real filmmaking equipment, except there's no camera attached. There's just a sensor that says, hi, I'm a camera. I'm over here. I've got a 50 millimeter lens on. I'm looking downward at 20 degrees and there's a line. And it's just as if you're playing a video game, except instead of controllers, and we do use controllers at times, we're using tripods, we're using wheels, we're using steady cams. So we're giving the filmmakers all the analog tools that they're accustomed to. Their instincts are reliable, but the output is all through this real-time game. Yeah, let's just back up the animation. You need to be a hair lower, though. All right. There you go. Let's do it right there. All right. This was a quick video uh, in order to uh, better explain uh, where we are with virtual production, what it is, and how it is used by uh, filmmakers. Uh, at the core, we we find uh, graphic engines, real-time graphic engines, which allows filmmakers to uh, communicate with, with the software, uh, to pre-visualize their scene, to make adjustments in real time, change the lighting, change the position of some objects on, on the virtual set. And this allows them to explore many different uh, creative ideas and iterate them quickly. Uh, at the same time, Technologies like virtual and augmented reality allow filmmakers to be immersed in the virtual space they are, uh, they are trying to shoot in. Uh, in this case, this is Steven Spielberg while making Ready Player One, which is set in this uh, quite distant future. And the only way to have an idea of this environment was to uh, put your headset on. Uh, digital Twins is another uh, very important concept uh, it's about capturing uh, reality, it's about capturing real world locations or real world objects uh, and create a 3D assets that later on you can uh, use in, in the process. You can capture uh, like th this island where an headset and being present in that island in this digital twin, this digital rec reconstruction of a real world location. And of course, there are a lot of other uh, technologies which uh, like motion capture or camera tracking, which take, uh, uh, which are important as well. Um, so the main benefits is of course, the one of allowing filmmaker to, to be free, to explore and to uh, explore different creative ideas and iterate them quickly. At the same time, uh, in this way, it's possible to uh, see how the scene would look like uh, instantly. You do not have to wait days or weeks before the VFX department add the VFX you, you wanted to see at the day of the shooting. Uh, with real-time game engines, you can instantly have a feedback on how uh, this integration would, would like would, will um, will look like, and uh, at the same time, uh, directors as well as cinematographers they can communicate their vision uh, in an easier way to the whole uh, to to other departments. Uh, collaborate remotely. This is something else very very relevant. Um, there are a number of uh, virtual platforms where you uh, can collaborate with your colleagues uh, remotely. Uh, think about a um, director and a cinematographer. M maybe one of them is uh, located in London and the other one in Los Angeles. But if, we, if they can be immersed in the same space in the digital reconstruction of the location where they are going to shoot in, let's say, one month, well, that's that's something doable. That's something possible, which would allow them to to start working on that, start doing pre-production and uh, share ideas, exchange thoughts. And of course, what you're doing in this virtual environment can be tracked, and so you can generate metadata. Um, what's what's the knowledge gap at the moment? What I've shown you is a video is. Uh, it's about the production of a blockbuster movie, very high-end with a lot of 
um, very skilled people with 25 years of VFX uh, in the VFX industry. Uh, they can rely on high technical uh, resources. What's missing is a workflow and the identification of the technologies available also for indie productions, for smaller productions, because my hypothesis is that uh, they can also get a benefit from uh, adopting this uh, new approach, this new process, the virtual production. Um, and um, and today, the, um, just to also to give you an idea uh, in regard of the different phases of uh, in the making of an audiovisual uh, production, we have pre-production, production and post-production. Uh, and in particular, what I'm interested in, interested in exploring is the location scouting phase, because in my opinion, the location uh, affects a lot of creative and productive decisions. So it's, it's a starting point that uh, need to be explored and understand how it can be are the benefits that the virtualization can bring to the stakeholders. Uh, so, of course, first it's important to understand where we are now when we talk about location scouting, how uh, small and medium sized uh, independent productions approaches uh, location scouting. Uh, it's important to understand which technologies and workflows are available today for capturing a digital twin of a real world location. And of course, at the end of this research, I expect to identify which uh, challenges can be solved using uh, immersive technologies and the uh, in, in, in digital twins uh, of real locations. So to do so, uh, I'll uh, adopt the double diamond uh, methodology uh, as well as I'll try to code adopt co-design because it's fundamental to understand what's uh, the feedback, which are the thoughts of the uh, potential stakeholder of this solution. They are at the center. Um, so interviews, observations, also workshop, if, if possible, are some of the methods I want to use and which at the end I want to triangulate in order to give more credibility to the research. Uh, what has been done so far is a uh, literature review uh, in regard of what has been published in the academia and what has been done by industry players. Of course, the, the piece is very, is very quick, so uh, it's, it, this phase is not over, but uh, a good part has been done. Uh, I take a look at the industry trends in order to understand which technologies, which workflows could be suitable for the design solution I'm thinking. And um, what's important to, to highlight is the Oculus Quest 2, which is quite, it's very affordable with uh, uh, high performances. The integration of the LiDAR scanner is a great, uh, um, it's, it, it, it's a very important step in order to digitalize virtual location and objects in general. And of course, uh, graphic engines like Unreal and Unity uh, are needed in order to create these, uh, ex this VR, this immersive experience. Um, the, the, my hypothesis is that uh, uh, filmmakers can be empowered by uh, this uh, digitalization, this virtualization of the location scouting. Uh, and this would lead to uh, time and money savings, as well as fostering the creativity. And the steps, very, very briefly, are three. You start with the capture of uh, a, a real world location, you create its own digital twin, which later on you can explore and navigate in VR, what you will end up, you will end up with a, a digital reconstruction of the real location. And if you're the director, you can start uh, being, can, becoming used to this location where you're going to shoot at. And at the same time, you can also invite other collaborators to join you in this virtual, uh, in, in this, in the virtual location. And you can start to, let's say, move a virtual dolly. You can start to uh, place some uh, lights in order to understand how, what's the best lighting setup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what has been done so far is also a first round of interview in order to identify the first challenges when doing location scouting. And overall, when presenting the prototype, this idea, I found a very positive feedback. Uh, one, one important point is the ease of use 
of this workflow. A deal breaker is the friction. A deal breaker is uh, this: how easy for them will be to to adopt this new uh, working habit, and that's 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 a crucial point. Uh, as well as the the photorealism is another theme that uh, I've touched during these interviews, and seems like uh, the possibility to navigate in this three D space uh, it's uh, uh, more important than recreating a, a realistic representation of the virtual location uh, and that's very encouraging um, what else what, what's what's the future of this research which is is still in the early stage of course uh, i'll have to expand the research to production and post-production stages understanding where uh, where can what can be done uh, always in regard of virtual location scouting uh, will be necessary to understand even more uh, digital twin concept and understand if something else uh, uh, in addition to the location can be uh, virtualized and recreated as, uh, as a digital twin, start prototyping the, uh, an immersive experience which would allow you to, to explore this location and uh, of course it will be necessary to, uh, key, to ask the feedback to the stakeholders uh, in order to iterate the prototype and, and get, making it better and better. And of course, publish the first advancements of the research. So thank you for your attention. If you want to reach out, if you have questions, just write me an email, I'll be more than happy to answer you. Thank you. Thank you, Aymone. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, so next up we have Pierre-Francois Girard, who is a 3D visualizer and mixed reality designer with a PhD in computer science from Goldsmiths. Uh, he will be presenting on virtual arch architecture frameworks for immersive learning environments. Pierre, if you'd like to join us on stage. Hello, hello. Hi, great. Well, <clears throat> thank you to, uh, to for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm going to share my presentation, which should appear now. Yes. So great. Yes. So um, well, first, um, um, so I'm yeah. I'm, thank you for for the presentation. Um, so. Uh, I think the best thing to do is I'm, I'm going to briefly um, give you an overall sense of my PhD journey uh, with the idea to share the main uh, drive behind this multidisciplinary uh, approach. So um, how did I got here and, and, and where did my research idea come from? Um, I grew up reading a lot of science fiction. Uh, no more answer made a strong impact on me for sure. And Comics in Belgium are a big part of our culture, uh, so that definitely had a, a good a good influence there. Um, but uh, yeah, I could definitely imagine uh, way more uh, the cyberspace than just a, a few uh, fluorescent lines. So um, I went on to study architecture, um, mainly thinking about how to apply the language of architecture and the skills of the architect to design this visual environment. Um, so architect design building based on constraint. These constraints are very different between the virtual and the physical uh, world. Um, so actually, maybe I could find only three that are still uh, holding their ground, which is function, um, meaning, and then aesthetic. So I start to explore those three uh, function, those three, um, uh, I would say those three, uh, um, constraint, if we can call them like this, um, and uh, I submit a real-time 3D user interface in response to a, a competition at the time, which was called the Library of the Information Age. So um, the main function that drives the search result is actually to create a virtual environment to support the organization of information as a sort of extension of the mind. So the following year, I completed a second master in information and communication science, exploring these ideas further. But then, um, even though the uh, virtual 
uh, reality technology was still progressing uh, at the time. Uh, I think the first uh, virtual headset was a commercial vir virtual headset was published in uh, 1987 by uh, Jérôme Lanier. It was very expensive, only a, a few uh, university were able to afford this. So definitely my architecture university was not able to afford this. So, but I went on to study architecture um, and I, uh, I submit this, uh, this, yeah, this um, desktop based uh, virtual, um, uh, virtual interface, sorry. And then uh, because the technology wasn't there, I went on, on to produce uh, uh, visuals, 3D visualization, 3D visualization for interior architecture mostly. So um, I produce hundreds of visual for physical architecture, but over the years I was never really satisfied with, with this kind of work, uh, finding that most of that was smoke and mirror. Uh, really frustrated not to be able to enter those space or having to wait that they were built. So as soon as I heard about the, the Oculus Rift, uh, I jumped back onto uh, my research and I started this, um, yeah, this part-time PhD. Um, so went on to do a lot of literature review, um, obviously looking into uh, how the spatial surrounding are represented. Uh, one of the main themes throughout the dissertation, uh, for instance, is the way object and scenes are represented in uh, the brain, uh, which is a, a big part of how you actually create these in virtual reality. Um, but it seems that cognitive scientists are far from agreeing on many subjects. So I decided to build a preliminary, preliminary experiment based on an, ex an existing method directly related to the extension of the mind, which is the method of Loki. Um, Francis Yates has written a whole book about that. It's also the, the art of memory. Um, so, well, here the main hypothesis was uh, that participants using memory palaces in VR would better recall a sequence of random playing cards by placing them along their journey compared to memorizing the deck of cards without any given method. So on the left, you can imagine that you have to remember the deck of cards like they are given to you. And then on the right, you can use the space to place those cards along your way. Um, and results were pretty uh, interesting, obviously. Uh, well, not obviously, but actually a lot of people were able to memorize the cards better by using virtual palaces. So that was really encouraging. Now, the other thing is I was comparing the effect of two different type of architecture. Uh, and there, it was a bit more difficult to understand if one type of architecture had a better impact than the other. Um, I wasn't really equipped uh, to give, uh, uh, to measure that um, and have a, a significant uh, reason there. So that drives the, the second part of my research. Um, so I, I went a bit deeper into uh, architect and, and the, the foundation of architecture. So here, this is a, a great example from uh, Crier, who, who studied uh, architecture in a way that he, he kind of went down to what's the essential part of architecture and, and, and start to look into how this kind of modification of a space uh, affect uh, people's behavior. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, the, the idea was to use uh, the smallest spatial unit as a starting point of a user study. Um, and that was really good because it was corresponding to actually the, the uh, space available when you are in a 60 OF uh, virtual uh, environment using, for instance, the uh, HTC Vive at the time. Um, so in parallel of that, I also discover about uh, space syntax and the use of isovist field, which is uh, isovist, which is a, a measure of, of space. Um, so in one world, an isovist is, uh, if you start from a, from a point, you, you, you use, you, you, um, you project an array of points a 360 degree around, around that point. And each time you touch a surface, you have a, a point of contact, and then you can trace a line and you end up with a geometrical shape that represents what you see 
or what's visible from one point. And so you can start to develop a whole sort of uh, technique and methodology to calculate different uh, spatial qualities like the openness of a space or the visual complexity of a space and really start to have some um, quantitative data on how to characterize uh, different space, um, which looks like this. <laughs> That's a really good visual of this. So um, I'm not going to go too much into detail into this. Uh, we, we can have further discussion on this. It's very, very interesting and it can be very easily applied in VR space. So this is just a, a snippet of the um, the, 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 the user study I built. Um, actually, I have a, a little animation. Maybe I can uh, show this animation quickly if I have a bit of time. I think I do. Um, how do I do this? Here, I can sh share this screen. And then I will comment on this. <clears throat> so I call this the navigational puzzle game. Um, the idea was to, to so this the first part is like a warm up, uh, but the idea is really that people have to collect uh, those blocks and then bring them onto the table and solve a puzzle. And then um, once they succeed to solve a puzzle, they get access to a, a new space. And then each room will have a different uh, architecture uh, with different special qualities, different, uh, different variables on the amount of openness you have. So obviously openness will be with more windows and complexity will be with more columns. And then I was able to measure um, so the, the effect on the way they perform the task. Um, so obviously, uh, with, well, not obviously, but <laughs> with, uh, with each task, they have a certain, they, they try to uh, uh, complete the task as fast as possible. But here you can see that they're struggling a little bit to pass the block, the colonies in the way. Um, and so it was really interesting to, to observe everyone moving around. And so they, there was no teleportation. They were really, people were really moving, uh, walking in the space. Uh, and that's what I was lucky enough to have a, a studio with uh, um, almost three by three meters to be able to, to run this kind of a mixed reality experiment. Um, the, the wall, the exterior wall of the physical room correspond to the, to the wall of the, of the virtual studio. So, uh, yeah, that gives a bit of, a, of an idea. Um, I'm just going to jump back onto the, the slides. Just let's wait this one. Uh, then you could see, uh, well, that was, yeah, then the, the new room loads. And you can see that that room doesn't have any columns or even barely any windows. Then I'll come back to the slides. And so, <clears throat> yeah, in a, maybe, oof, it's already, time is flying. Um, maybe in a, briefly, uh, the, the findings there were that um, the, 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 the room with the more columns and the less window uh, was shown to be the most effective one. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the explanation quickly, the explanation on that is uh, what happened is that when there was a lot of window, actually, people were taking more time to look through the window because there were other elements outside. So maybe that's an explanation. Uh, I would have to run more, much more user study to really go into the into, into more detail into what does what, but yeah, there was some uh, encouraging uh, results for that. And then the, the conclusion is really to wrap it up is to the, the, the contribution of, of that study is really, um, I mean, it's not ready to use as a one size fits all type of architecture for sure. But the, the, actually one of the great power of VR is that 
every movement and interaction between the user and their surrounding can be captured and measured. And a lot of attention has been given so far to improve these interactions, but not much attention has been given to the spatial design of the environment itself. So uh, that's what the virtual architecture framework proposes uh, to integrate a series of measures to support the design of efficient virtual environment. Uh, and obviously, I can go into more detail there, but um, I'm happy to, uh, to, to keep the discussion uh, going after that, or I'm happy to have further discussion by email, um, or you can also find a little bit of uh, my interest on Twitter at uh, Archie Memory. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, and now for the last presentation, we have Sharma Raman from the University of the Arts London talking on how can AI enable development of novel design processes that will support the co-creation of future fashion. Hi, Sharma. Hi, yeah. Hi. Thank you for, for joining us and the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and you will the infinity loop for a second. Um, and here we are. So today I am here in the of the R&D project lead for a pioneer, a pioneering fashion tech company uh, called Away to Mars, where um, our idea is to advance their current co-creation platform into a collaborative fashion design platform that is gamified in order to encourage this uh, creativity for both consumers and designers alike. And specifically, we are looking at the collaboration between AI and human um, for both um, its capacity uh, as, as a tool within co-creation and encouraging collaboration, and also how it sparks creativity. Um, and a little bit of background um, as to who I am and why I've been asked to join the team. I'm a, a multidisciplinary person, uh, as a creative practitioner. I am a musician and also uh, a storyteller and actor. Um, so you can see me at the bottom there playing the lead of a 24 part um, BBC drama series that was actually Southeast Asia's first supernatural detective thriller. So um, think Buffy meets uh, Scooby-Doo meets X-Files there. So that was um, quite an interesting uh, experience in my life. And then um, on the sort of uh, middle left, you'll see that um, I am actually performing without any shoes or socks on in the middle of Antarctica. So I'm getting uh, kind of stimulated multisensorially there. Um, and that is actually something that um, I've taken into uh, in many parts of my of my work uh, within creativity, um, not only within music, um, where you know I, I also like uh, this liminal space between analog and digital, where you can see me working with the Mimu gloves there um, in live performance, which can actually um, uh, utilize movement. Um, uh, in order to create music and visuals, uh, but also within my own sort of interdisciplinary PhD, which was looking at the neuroscience underlying the different mental modes that are related to different creative activities and also different stages of creative thinking. Um, I've also taken this multisensorial approach uh, in order to be um, the artistic director of art science creative production agency, Jugular, tagline joining the head and the heart, where the idea was to bring together a lot of academic um, topics, uh, whether within the sciences or philosophy or well, nigh anything, but you know, very heady topics that maybe do not see anything apart from the, uh, you know, the light of ivory towers and papers and uh, research, but bringing it into lived visceral experience via performance, um, experiences such as you can see on the right hand side where um, I have a curious little uh, transducer um, mouthpiece um, where we were literally influencing the sound of music uh, via the the taste of the lolly that I had there. So um, it was actually scientifically validly influenced there where uh, people genuinely thought 
that the lolly was either sweet or sour, depending on the music that they were listening to, uh, which we composed especially for this. So um, this uh, approach actually is something that I've outlined in a TEDx talk, if you are interested to, to go and uh, view that. And also some of the PhD findings are in this Springer publication over here um, on the multidisciplinary contributions of the science of creative thinking. Um, putting all of these sorts of, um, say, uh, analog ideas into practice in the digital world, I then founded NeuroCreate, um, utilizing AI as a way to augment creative processes. And um, essentially, we've created a framework um, that can take you through the different stages of creative thinking uh, during brainstorming and ideation, um, and uh, not only help you arrive at an actionable insight, but also to be uh, training you to, to be thinking creatively every day. And so with this sort of background, um, I applied and was accepted to be the R&D project lead uh, for this particular instance of AI being utilized to um, help in the co-creation within fashion design. And so this approach um, is what I call neurodesign, bringing together the knowledge of the neurological underpinnings um, of a particular cognition and, uh, or behavior in order to design products and experiences in a way that works with the human mind. And um, over here, uh, you'll see the poster that we've been presenting uh, at Beyond 2020. And uh, Away to Mars um, has already established a co-creative platform that I mentioned to you. This is currently a static HTML uh, web uh, site where uh, designers, um, which are part of Away to Mars, has cultivated um, community over the last four years, uh, upload their designs um, in response to Away to Mars's um, own uh, callouts um, or when they work with brands such as Missoni, for example. Um, and what I've been doing since uh, joining is experimenting with how AI comes into this whole uh, process. You know, how can it enable um, uh, the development of novel design processes and how can it support co-creation? And what you see here in this large dress is actually a collaboration between um, the ATM as we like to call it, Away to Mars ATM, uh, ATM's uh, designers um, with uh, influence and inspiration from Missoni, but then also uh, this has been collaborated with by an AI. So that's a tripartite approach there on that on that big image. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see another four mini dresses, uh, which again are fruits of some of the experiments of um, you know, uh, my sort of AI application uh, on uh, current Away to Mars's aesthetics. And I'm gonna go into this uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, so, but before I do that, I thought it would be uh, quite nice for you guys to see, for example, what Away to Mars is currently doing as well. So, so you can see how that sort of process actually takes place. And this is an actual uh, collaboration with UAL, um, with the Creative Clusters and the, the Business of Fashion Textiles and Technology Partnership, and obviously the AHRC, and specifically been mentored by the Digital Anthropology Lab within London College of Fashion. So what you see here um, is a very slow-mo uh, of the AI generating new images um, and, and thinking as it's going along. Um, and uh, what we did here is actually um, replace, and I'll show you that in a bit, where we basically um, mixed in uh, some of the original Away to Mars dresses um, with inspiration uh, from uh, botanical illustrations um, of birds and uh, plants. So bringing in non-fashion elements there. And just so you can see a little bit of what Away to Mars is actual uh, sort of, you know, non-AI aesthetics are. Here we have, um, a particular season here, uh, you'll see some of the sort of um, sort of interesting uh, prints, the crazy prints there. Um, and this is Alfredo um, Orobia, who is the founder and CEO of Away to Mars, talking about this. Um, and here are the sort of um, processes normally. I'm just speeding through this. So, for example, let's see if that comes through. Um, this is, you know, uh, them. Uh, and the co-founder Morelia actually collaborating with Missoni as well and actually making these patterns. I actually own um, one of these uh, dresses they gave me very kindly here, very, very beautiful. So you can see already the way to Mars is aesthetics, um, you know, and how, and, and these are sort of how it can be sort of inspired with Missoni. Now, what you can see here is a completely AI generated um, 
uh, uh, texture and prints, and then how we can then uh, mix some of that, for example, with Away to Mars's existing um, aesthetics and sketches. And you can see some pretty interesting things coming through here, for example. Um, and you can you can do this uh, slower, um, you know, on the showcase as well if you wanted to look at this. And here we are actually mixing it not just with sketches, but actually images uh, from mountains, literally photographs from mountains. You can see quite slowly as well how this beautifully morphs. Um, finally, and this is uh, for example birds, as I was mentioning, and um, some of the uh, the plants there. Again, morphing beautifully into um, shapes that we can recognize as garment dresses, right? Um, I will go through these again in a little bit more detail, but quite pretty there. Um, here we go. So here we are. Um, so I'll give you an idea. This is, yep, the bird sort of very slowly morphing. And it's quite interesting to see you know, if we're looking at this idea of co-creation, you know, where amongst this process um, do you feel most inspired to create something completely new? I mean, I really love this, for example. Um, these are all these sort of what I call liminal spaces. It's even making me think of a different shape, obviously, for what a dress could look like. But maybe it's just that sort of figment that makes me think of a completely new print. Um, now you begin to start seeing it take more shape and form that we can recognize as um, some of the Away to Mars's, um, uh, well, not only the aesthetics from the print, but also the actual sort of garment shapes that they, they um, have the sort of best-selling uh, best um, uh, modes of. And then here, this is a sort of, um, once it's been trained, that was the AI essentially being trained, say, uh, and merging, and that's actually a generative adversarial network. This is some of the outputs um, now once trained of a whole bunch of new uh, images that is a result of AI human collaboration within fashion design, within imagery. So I think really that's rather beautiful. Um, and me going back now to um, looking at this in, in a little bit more depth, just to show you some of the um, sort of behind the scenes experimentation that's been going on with this. Um, the, yeah, let's go back to here and so, so here are some, for example, completely purely generated um, uh, textures that have been created um, by a, a, a style GAN and has nothing to do away, with Away to Mars's um, aesthetics at this point. And then again, using another type of AI to mask this so it could be put on garments. And so you can start visualizing what a dress might actually look like. This one looks particularly crazy here. Um, and then here, this is just taking swathes of color, different swathes of colors as you can see and the unpredictable yet rather beautiful way um, it comes onto what a dress might look like or you know just a sketch of a dress now here this is the results of um, bringing in the way to Mars's aesthetics with as I was mentioning something completely non-fashion such as images of mountains there and then here again are the ones uh, where it is uh, images of um, well not images actually sketched drawings of botanical um, birds and plants, right? And you can see that some of them are uh, very fully formed, like here. This is something that, you know, I could imagine then, you know, sending off to have a higher resolution print being made and then actually being printed finally. And you can also see how it has variations on a theme. This is me kind of looking through and going, do you know what? Here are quite a few of something quite similar. And, you know, this is something that AI has already been utilized as where it's like, you know, how can it could be, you know, be used as a decision-making tool for, um, you know, humans to then sit there and go, hmm, here's some variations. I prefer this one, for example. This is my preferred one here. But here in the middle, these again are some of those sort of crazy shapes whilst it was, um, you know, dreaming its way through to the final end where I find these are really, really interesting, very creative uh, sparkers. So the liminal space here. Now, finally, here, um, this um, is what I think, you know, so far has been the most effective and interesting um, sort of more beautiful uh, sort of creations where, in fact, we're, we're layering over multiple sort of things where we have the Away to Mars's, um, you know, aesthetics. We're bringing in uh, things like mountains or whatever it is. And then on top of that, uh, you know, overlaying um, complete sort of a newly generated textures. I mean, I would definitely wear either this one or this one, for example. 
Um, and here we are, some, um, some of the ones that, you know, uh, seem to be more inspiring uh, to, to end up in my wardrobe at least. But, you know, we are now thinking about how to create a collection of 10 AI human uh, dresses um, in order to come to a uh, catwalk runway show somewhere near you at some point um, in the near future. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Mama. Um, if Thank you. Um, the rest of the participants would like to pop up on stage so that we can quickly exchange some questions. Hi, Mona. Um, and we're waiting for Pierre and uh, Aimone. If they can join on, on the screen. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your talks. Uh, they were really fascinating. Um, I feel like there is this running theme of interactivity and collaboration through, throughout all of the talks. So you have the Shaman you have collaboration between sort of human and AI in, in, in design. And then Simon, you have this interactive filmmaking project that aims to give voices to those who are not always heard in the majority. And then here you have this virtual sort of um, kind of analysis of space. Um, so and Aimone, he also had this sort of virtual scouting um, and the sort of with, that facilitates collaboration between filmmakers on a single project. So can you maybe talk to us a little bit about why interactivity and collaboration are so important and how, how does digital technology facilitate that? How does it enhance that? Well, uh, uh, if I jump in quickly, I, I want just to say that for me, mostly for people in virtual reality, this is kind of a, a whole new medium that takes into account every other medium. So you kind of need uh, someone that knows about audio, someone that knows about visual, someone that knows about haptics, someone that knows about architecture, someone that knows about interaction. And you can't, yeah, you need definitely a, a collaboration of a great team to to achieve uh, some new project um, in in that sense mm -hmm. in in regard of uh, the making of an audiovisual production action when while you are doing a, a movie or a film you have to translate the script into images and uh, everyone think about the, the the scene in a different way so being able to represent uh, virtually your ideas it's something very helpful that uh, uh, foster collaboration it's many times uh, it's all about communication the director with the scenographer the director with the cinematographer so being able to um, take advantage of what's possible what's possible with the real-time game engine it's uh, it's it's very important point and uh, we will see these uh, process uh, growing right now is used mainly across big productions because they have the expertise and the technical resources to do that but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, will be um, will become more common to take advantage of what's possible through the use of emotive technologies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in my case, Maybe two main points. If I apply um, this reflection onto the communities that I work with, uh, one is that in times like this, uh, it's even more important to have tools that people can use to recreate a sense of community uh, remotely. And especially with a viewpoint on mental health, uh, of course, there has been a lot going on during COVID, uh, both in terms of isolation, but also in terms of overload, screen overload for some. Um, so yeah, I'm just throwing it there because it's an area that could be explored this way. But in terms of using these tools in communities, there is still uh, work that needs to be done to make tools more accessible. In the case of my own project, um, it was a successful project, but it required three years of research and work, which is something that most organizations, if it wasn't a PhD project or a university project, they wouldn't be able to afford. Um, there is still um, involvement of developers and programmers, which is fine, but again, it's an expertise that's quite expensive. 
for small communities. And hopefully it's something that my lab is doing, developing an interactive filmmaking tool, which could be accessible to filmmakers directly, will make this a more accessible process for communities as well. But there is still a bit that needs to be done before we get there. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, someone... yeah, I would, I would, I would second um, what Simona is saying um, in the sense that uh, it's especially useful now in remote working uh, sort of senses to to be able to keep the sort of community alive. Um, and I mean, it, you know, a version of the co-creation platform was available before. And why we are thinking about making this, you know, all singing, all dancing, and some at some point, you know, with with AI involved in it, is I think there's also an element of democratizing the whole process of fashion for everybody involved because fashion is also incredibly like requires loads of different people involved you know from the designer to the pattern cutter to the printmaker to the seller um you know um but it does feel a little bit like you can't necessarily access you know that whole sort of industry you know if i wanted to be a consumer that wants to be you know involved in making my own clothing i mean i wouldn't necessarily know where to start i mean i might because i now know it but like you know say 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 somebody like joe blogs on the street may not right and so I think um, what we're trying to do as well is like, how can we utilize the technology to to democratize? A, bring it accessibility, like putting it on a web, you know, web based, so that I can even like look at it on my phone. But B, you know, kind of provide a toolkit, like a palette of ingredients to choose from in order to like really be you know involved um, in in the sort of creation of something. But also, you know, how can we bring the joy of collaborating into this? And you know, how can we be playful? And you know, why creativity is so so you know. Um, actually, like Simone was saying, you know, uh, useful for useful. I mean, just beneficial for our well-being. Um, and uh, yeah, so so the idea is how to we, we're trying to create a game actually with with this whole thing, um, you know. And at the end of it, you know, you, you come up with something really rather beautiful. So that's the idea. Fantastic. Um, I'm being told that we are running out of time and it's like we're running now. But um, thank you very much for joining us for this session. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, the rest of the audience, please do uh, visit the Beyond Conference website to have a look at the posters. Um, and I'm sure that all of our researchers will be more than happy to answer additional questions if you get in touch with them either by email or their social media handles and um, other profiles. And um, yeah, in the meantime, thank you very much. This is the last session of the Need the Researchers on the last day of Beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.